what a great pleasure it is to be here and how enjoyable I found the conference. Uh, I always argue that the best people in the world are development professionals. Uh, they're always outgoing and friendly, and that's exactly what I found uh, at this meeting. Your uh, organization has been in existence since 1999, and if you actually go to the website, there's an interesting article about the history of fundraising in schools by uh, one of your founding members, Margaret Abbott. Uh, and it describes the fact that fundraising in schools is a relatively recent phenomenon, although yesterday, of course, it was reported it now generates 190 million pounds a year. So rather like universities, fundraising is becoming a mainstream activity that will actually be a pillar of school funding in the future. Uh, in this presentation, what I want to do is reflect on the state of philanthropy in general and in education in particular in 2016, review the implications of serious fundraising for any institution, explore who should do that fundraising and the implications for the head of the institution and the senior team. I'll talk for about 15 minutes, uh, 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 for ha half an hour, and then leave 15 minutes for discussion. So where is educational philanthropy in 2016? Well, as Rebecca said, in 2003, I was asked to chair a review called Increasing Voluntary Donations in Higher Education. That was actually reported in 2004, and has since, as you say, become known as the Thomas Report. It's interesting because it came about as a commitment in that government's recent white paper to set up such a review. And the government actually at the time had committed to two other reviews, one about admissions and another about better regulation. And both of those reviews had numerous members, vast numbers of civil servants, and were matters of great interest in the specialist press and the admissions review in the uh, general press. Uh, our review precipitated absolutely no interest whatsoever. Uh, there were only four of us on the panel, and we were looked after by only two civil servants. However, I said to the panel at the first meeting that whilst we were the Cinderella of the three reviews, our report would be the one that had the biggest impact on higher education in the long term. This, of course, was met with complete incredulity. But actually, that has been the outcome. Virtually nobody can remember the Better Regulation Review or the uh, Admissions Review, but our report changed how universities addressed fundraising in matters that I will go on to discuss. It also changed aspects of their governance and operation, especially in the senior team. That report distilled itself down to three fundamental question, uh, messages. The first was that it was perfectly legitimate for universities to ask for philanthropic support. The second was that there's a very well-described business called fundraising with a spectrum of activities, and if you led and managed that business well, you would see a return. And finally, we stressed that there was little point in fretting about whether the UK had a giving culture, because higher education at that stage didn't even have an asking culture. For those of you who suffer from insomnia, the report can be found on the web, <laughs> and uh, we will uh, send you the URL. But there are one or two little jewels inside it which you might want to think about. The first is a chapter that discusses the legitimacy of fundraising, which was written by Martin Williams, a very senior civil servant, and it's an absolutely brilliant exposition of the issues and the justification for universities to ask for philanthropic support. And if you're having some difficulty getting that message heard inside your institution, it's a damn good chapter to have at your hand. Um, I'd recommend it to you. The second is that there is a very clear description of your average fundraising office in that report. You can almost take it off the shelf and decide what best fits your operation and which parts of it you would want. Now, the impact on the sector for the report was very significant. Many universities started fundraising for the first time. All of them started to take their alumni and other potential supporters much more seriously. The government gave £230 million in two matched funding schemes in order to encourage donations. And philanthropic income to the higher education sector in the last year was £800 million and will inevitably top the £1 billion in the not-too-distant future. The number of donors increases every year, as does the number of alumni who give. 
we all tend to think of figures of 50 and 60 percent, you know, which is what Princeton quotes as their alumni giving. But actually, the average alumni giving in the United States of America is 12 percent. And actually, Bristol, 6.5 percent of our alumni, all conductable alumni, gave to the university last year. So we can move performance towards what happens in the United States of America. So 12 years later, how does it look? Well, the headline figures I've given to you speak for themselves, but there are some complexities below that. The majority of universities have not continued to invest heavily in fundraising, and the sector has differentiated into about 30 universities who take it very seriously, and that's up from four in 2003, and then the rest who concentrate probably on alumni relations but not so much on fundraising. There is definitely more asking, and vice-chancellors are becoming far less embarrassed about asking. Perhaps the biggest change is that the descriptive noun for the activity has moved on. So it was fundraising in 2003, and it kind of moved to development in 2009 and 10. And now the word that's commonly being used is advancement. Now, advancement is a very clumsy word imported from North America. Uh, and initially in higher education, it met with great uh, resistance. I have actually promised an extremely good bottle of claret to anyone who can come up with a better word than advancement. I haven't had to give that bottle of claret yet, but we'll see. Um, but essentially, it encompasses all of the activities that advance the institution, marketing, public relations. I know I don't have to tell you this, but alumni relations, fundraising, and other important stakeholder relations, such as government, civil service, local politicians, third sector, relations with industry. In other words, everything going under one roof called advancement. And in universities, the leader of this activity within the institution is now becoming an established member of the senior team. There are now pro-vice-chancellors for advancement. There are vice-presidents for advancement, and they sit in the senior team and in the kitchen cabinet that meets you know, every Monday and Tuesday. And this because there's, there is a, an unregulated market now in UK and overseas students, completely unregulated, and it's a very, very, very competitive world out there. And how your university projects itself how is it seen, what is its brand, what is its networks is now of vital importance to the health of the institution. And I know that's the same situation in many of our schools, that there is a fiercely competitive world out there, particularly in some parts of the independent sector. So perhaps the first answer to my title, what priority should fundraising have in schools, is a very important priority, not only because it would bring income, but because it is a central pillar of a broader strategic focus called advancement, which will be a new way of thinking about the future of your school. I'd like to make, finally, in this section, some thoughts about the philanthropic culture in the UK. Certainly, and in higher education and in philanthropy more generally, I find a population that's prepared to give more than the one I found in 2003. Giving to education is much more part of mainstream conversation and much more accepted. There is a growing sense in the UK that the state cannot provide all, and those who can give should give. For a man of my generation, this is a very, very major uh, shift, and I think people have forgotten that the post-war consensus was that the state would provide against a background of high taxation. Uh, asking people like me, age 63, for charity, when I experienced personally the highest level of personal tax ever historically, which was in 1976, is a difficult call. Uh, but I do believe that people in my generation's attitudes are changing. I'm glad we have an asking culture and that we are slowly changing our attitudes to philanthropy, but we're still a long way from a giving culture like the United States of America. I find it really interesting, for example, that my peer group, reasonably well-off people, generally do not have any planned charitable giving. The pressure to give does not exist in our society like it does in the States. 
I have a friend who lives in San Diego, and she's on the fundraising board of University of California, San Diego. She says if you're well off in San Diego, and that would be people like me, and you don't give, you simply don't get the big ticket invitations. There's nothing malicious about it. It's just as an expectation in US society that the fortunate will share uh, their wealth. And the other main difference, which I just thought I'd point out out of interest, uh, between the UK and the US is the place of religion in their society. 50% of uh, the United States of America go to church, and in some parts of the United States of America, 100% attendance in a town of church. Less than 4% of our citizens now go to formal religious uh, ceremonies. Uh, as a child, that's where I learned my philanthropy. When the plate came round at Mass, and when you put to the gate the charities that were going to Africa. If we're not going through that kind of formal uh, ed education about philanthropy because uh, we're not attending church so much, where do young people learn their philanthropic duty now? And I think that's a major difference. So my conclusion is we're not the same giving culture as the US yet. We're quite good at big events such as children in need when large numbers of us give small amounts of money, but less good at the fortunate in society being purposeful and planned in their giving. And I believe there lies an opportunity because I believe those individuals do have the capacity for more purposeful giving. They are on a, on a change in their beliefs. They just need to be asked in the correct way. And education is, I'm sure, something that would attract them. So a real opportunity for schools and for universities. Next part of my talk is if you, what is needed if you want to be serious about fundraising in a school. Uh, in any educational establishment. The first and most obvious comment is you must decide whether you want to fundraise or not. Uh, it's rational to decide that the potential gains for your school with the demography of its pupils, parents, and its geographical locality mean it's unlikely for you to realize very significant philanthropic income, and therefore there's no point in starting on the journey. That, of course, leaves the question of advancement hanging but that can be answered uh, without including fundraising. If, however, you decide there's potential for fundraising, it's really important to accept that you need to be serious about it. There's actually nothing worse, and I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience, than a half-hearted attempt at fundraising that will inevitably fail and leave quite a bitter leg legacy with senior staff and governors and we'll put it off the agenda for many years in the future. My colleagues at Graham Pelton consider it takes three years as a minimum before you see a return on investment in a new program at a school. Uh, uh, so time and patience are crucial. And that observation predominantly comes from the United States, not from the UK. And it may well be that the lead time in the UK is longer. And so people have to understand this is a three to five to seven year game, not an overnight game. The next point is you need someone to lead on fundraising. I would argue that should be a full-time professional. Or if you give somebody time in your own uh, organization, please make sure they get the time. Uh, this is not something that can just be added on to somebody's already full-time job. My initial target in a school would be to establish an alumni supporters database, probably research target trusts and foundations, although I gather they're less important in the school sector than they are in higher education. Um, and I would set an ambition that you should be asking your supporters, alumni, parents, and others, at least once a year. Everybody should get, that was an ambition we set in Bristol. Everybody gets asked at least once a year uh, initially, it can either be postal or through alumni magazines or email uh, uh, and through a direct ask, perhaps as an e-newsletter. I know I'm stating the obvious here, but this is really hard graft and the payoff is long term. And these two realities of the hard graft and the long term payoff mean that actually universities particularly seem to start avoiding to do it properly. And it's the absolute basis of your fundraising uh, success in the medium to long term. My experience was that many of those who were asked for the first time and initially gave small amounts turned into bigger donors over the years. 
We set about with our ambition of Ask Everybody at least once a year in 2003. And what I saw was over the 10 years to 2013-14 that I was increasingly writing more and more letters thanking people for 10 to 50,000 pound donations, which I was not doing in 2003. And some of those people, of course, went on to be much bigger donors. And one of the great benefits for schools that I, I, I was thinking about is that relatively small donations can make a really big difference to you. I mean, the Department of Chemistry at the University of Bristol can burn £20,000 in an hour. Whereas you, you might imagine what a donation of £20,000 can do in your school. And then comes to the issue of high net worth individuals. Uh, in the States, there's a rule called 95-5, I don't know if you've heard of that, which is 95% of your donations will come from 5% of your donors. Uh, and actually, there are now some people in the States that think that should be 97-3. Now, the States is a different world. It's simply richer than us, and there are a significantly higher percentage of very well-off individuals, and they're quite liquid with their cash. We have far less wealthy people, and people who tend to be illiquid, their money is in property. Uh, and, uh, but that doesn't take away from the fact that high net worth individuals have the capacity to make a transformational impact on your institution and really must be part of a fundraising office. Now I'm going to go on to uh, discuss the relationship between the senior team and those high net in, in, uh, worth individuals. But my conclusion is that a good but not necessarily large fundraising office in a school will be characterized by an effective alumni database, good relations with trusts and foundations, an annual fund that asks all supporters, and by stewarding and trying to get close to uh, um, high net worth individuals. I think to put things in perspective, educational philanthropic income in the United States of America exceeded 40 billion dollars last year. There's a lot of potential out there, even in the UK. If you're starting from nothing, and many of you will have, it can be quite daunting, and uh, I would advise help at an early stage will pay dividends in the future, and Becky was saying this yesterday. It might be a colleague, it might be the people at IDPE, it might be a professional consultancy. We certainly found external advice at the beginning of our planning for a campaign extraordinarily helpful both in the long and short term. So finally, we come to the part of my talk about the implications of serious fundraising for the head and the senior team in the school. Firstly, let's think about the head. I have always said that being head of a school is one of the most powerful and important leadership positions in society. Not only is the public and personal value of education so important, but also the duty to do that excellently and effectively so that your pupils thrive is profound both to them and the societies that the school serves. And the head is absolutely vital in this mission. It is the nature of schools that their size means that the head can close lead all or the vast majority of the staff and pupils. And this ability to interact closely with staff and pupils means that the values culture and ambition of the school are very acutely shaped by the personality and ethos of the head. Those daily interactions between the head and the members of the school are a hugely important leadership tool. Compare that with the vice chancellor, 23,000 students, 6,000 members of staff. I could not possibly engage in such close leadership. Uh, my job was to close lead a small senior team and to proselytize the culture, ambitions of the university in larger and rather more staged fora. How the has Vice Chancellor behaves personally does trickle through the organization, but it does take a very long time and not in such an acute way uh, as it does for the head of a school. So the dilemma for the head is that if the school wants to take fundraising seriously, this is going to take a significant amount of his or her time. Time in the past that would have been spent in engaging in that close leadership role that I've discussed before. And there's no point in trying to avoid this, right? Because the head is the single most important person in your fundraising. There's a term which many do not like, 
but I think it's quite a good term, which is called brand carrier. Who is the brand carrier of your institution? Who is the person who's most responsible for portraying the brand of the school? And I can say categorically that the head of an educational institution is the most powerful and important brand carrier. I have no doubt, and I have been told, and I'm being honest with you, not vain, that many of our most significant donors gave to Bristol because of me. They had other reasons, of course, their alumni or parents or education was a main philanthropic focus. However, to give to a particular institution, they have to trust that that place is progressing, has a rational plan for the future, knows what it's fundraising for and why, and that it is well led. In the end, the person that has to be able to tell that story best is the head. This has two implications. The first is that better be a story. I mean, quite seriously. Uh, I've said elsewhere that the hardest work I ever did was to host dinners of about three hours for six to eight high net worth individuals uh, discussing the current state of Bristol, our future plans, and how their philanthropy might make a difference. I had to be right on the money, and I mean right on the money 99% of the time. I needed to be well-versed in our strategy, to know about Bristol's place in higher education generally, to be very knowledgeable about the sector, and to be able to convince them that our philanthropic targets were part of a wider institutional strategy, and frankly, not just dreamed up in my office on an afternoon. Just like everybody else, these potential donors, of course, think it's really easy to run universities. Uh, and I bet you that's the same for schools. Everybody can run a school, can't they? Everybody can run a university. Many of them have little idea of the reality of the education sector in the UK in 2016, of its complexity, its mix of public and private, the political challenges of leading in a world of constant change, especially change emanating from Westminster and Whitehall. They don't understand the fact that we essentially lead by consensus and not by diktat. And they have a tendency to state that if only we run ourselves like the private business that they're in, which has made the money, then we would be doing uh, so much better. And there's also a slightly kind of subtextual belief that if you're in the educational sector, sort of kind of especially the public education sector, you must by definition be really rather ordinary, not all that efficient in your job, because otherwise you'd be in the private sector. So all of that has to be tackled head on. As do the challenging questions from very successful people and talented people, that's why they're there in that room with you, as to why your institution isn't top of the league table. And what are you doing about the various stories about your school or your university that might have got into the press or have just become part of the general discourse? So in view of this, the head at these kind of meetings really needs to be at the top of his or her game and needs to prepare very well for these encounters, all of which takes time and effort. And I can report to you that I was never, ever more exhausted than at the end of those dinners, ever. However, they paid off. We got huge new supporter engagement. All of our 12 member campaign board came as a result of these dinners. Most of our biggest donations came from people we'd engaged for the first time through that mechanism. They were a very successful part of our fundraising strategy. So if you're going to do this kind of fundraising, this has significant implications for the head and thus inevitably for the senior team. When we were in the middle of our centenary campaign, we planned that I did about 40 days a year fundraising, and during the centenary year in 2009, that was planned to be 60 days. So I sat down with the chair of my governing body and stated categorically that the solution to this was not that I did an additional 40 or 60 days work on top of the normal day job. My day job had to change. And what happened was that I became significantly less engaged in the operation of the university. We decided that my role was strategic leadership, close leadership of the senior team, representation of the institution in all its facets, including fundraising, and being the most important intelligence gatherer for the university. I only had two direct reports. 
and the degree of operational delegation was very, very substantial. There were many middle to upper level operational decisions made in the University of Bristol in which I was neither involved in any way and often not knowledgeable about. My personal opinion is that with universities as large as they currently are, this is the inevitable role of a vice chancellor, but fundraising makes that even more imperative. So the challenge for me is how do you square that in schools where the operational close leadership role of the head is much more acute. And my first advice is that the senior team and the governors have to sit down and decide realistically what their commitment to fundraising is and be honest about the possibilities and the implications of that. There's a tendency to be unrealistic about what will be needed to fundraise successfully and as I've already said about uh, the, the length of time taken to achieve success. If a decision is made to commit to serious fundraising, it's vital that the individuals involved remain committed. There shouldn't be any backsliding when, it's a, when there's a downtime during the fundraising. And that's really important for members of the senior team and the governors. As I said, three years before you see a return on investment. There will need to be a serious conversation about the roles and the makeup of the senior team and the degree of delegation of decision making. I don't think you can be successful without a serious fundraising professional and there needs to be agreement about the funding for such a person and their place in the senior team and their reporting lines. In conclusion, if an institution is going to fundraise seriously, there are significant implications for the head and the senior team who will have to take on different expanded roles and responsibilities. The planning for this needs to be purposeful and realistic and reflect the needs of the school and an assessment of the role of the head in the close leadership activity that I've described beforehand. There's one more group that I haven't touched upon yet and that is lay support either from alumni or friends. Should you have a fundraising board and what would its presence mean to the governance and running of the school? I am firmly of the opinion that lay involvement is vital and can be very productive. They can bring an outside view to the activity and they provide great advice. By bringing them closer to the school they become more engaged and some will go on to be your most important supporters, possibly even governors. Many will be your biggest donors. And finally, they have great credibility. They are not paid to say the school is great, as the head is or the Vice-Chancellor is. So when they say that the school is great and worth supporting, it is very credible. Uh, it's very credible to other potential donors. They also bring great networks and offer opportunities that you possibly wouldn't have been able to access. So support from lay members is a good thing. The challenge is how is that organized? And if I was starting de novo, I would not start a separate charity independent of the school's governance. I would not make the fundraising board, or whatever you want to call it, part of the school's governance. I would not make it a subcommittee of the governing body. I would have it as a standalone entity that has a remit to advise the head and the development director about fundraising and to provide support in so doing. And the reporting line to the uh, governing body is through the head and the development director, not through the chairman of the fundraising body. I do appreciate that many of you inherit different arrangements and this can lead to difficulties when the ambitions and mission of the fundraising board and the school and the governing body start to di diverge. However, all these things can be managed and excellent lay members are a real boost to the head and frankly they can share with him or her some of the additional new uh, burden of fundraising. So in summary, for many of you Fundraising in schools is already an important activity and it's inevitable. It will become more important for more schools in the future. There are opportunities for fundraising in 2016 that there simply weren't there in 2003 and a much more positive philanthropic culture around education. There's a well-described business called fundraising. There is nothing new under the sun and each institution will decide which part of it they want and how much of it they want to practice. 
I've suggested an alumni ba database, trusts and foundations, annual fund annual ask, and high net worth individuals. Serious fundraising has implications for the role of the head, and thus inevitably for the roles of the senior team. The team and the governing body need to be clear about those implications and plan for and implement them. And finally, lay members are a very important source of support. I'm fully aware that much of what I've talked about, as I said earlier on, uh, comes from my experience in universities and have always kept the difference between them and schools at the front of my mind while writing this talk. However, much of what I said, I would argue, is generic to both. At its best, Fundraising will enable a clear articulation of the school's future, will engage new and important people in your school, will be part of enabling a more delegated leadership style, which is probably the future anyway, especially for large schools, will bring new income and enable things to happen quicker and better, and finally, it is normally or almost inevitably great fun especially working with development professionals who are by nature outgoing and engaging people. And one final thought, and uh, uh, it was reflected yesterday, you are in charge of fundraising. Nobody else is in charge of it, not some apparat uh, inside the Westminster bubble in intervening. You're in charge of it. It's not subject to outside interventions, and it is very, very empowering. So the answer to my question, the title of my talk, what priority should fundraising uh, take for schools, is a resoundingly high priority, but do it professionally, with careful planning, and with clear philanthropic targets. Thank you. <laughs>